So as Jared said, my name's Mike Dewar. I'm a data scientist at the New York Times Research and Development Lab. Uh, you can tweet at me at, uh, at Mike Dewar. Like Jared said, I don't really use R that much, so this is a strange experience uh, for me. Um, what I thought I would do instead today is talk a little bit about how we talk about our work in data science. So uh, give a little, uh, try and think about rhetoric for a while. So um, I started thinking about this because last month I was fortunate enough to attend three uh, workshops, three data-related workshops back to back. So one was in DC and it was about um, data collaboratives. So it was about the federal government thinking about how to share uh, the data they have access to. The second one was here in New York uh, at Data and Society, which is a, a research outfit here. And they were thinking about um, the policy around autonomous systems. And then the third workshop was uh, at Columbia at the journalism school there at the Tau Center, and they were concerned with um, algorithmic transparency. Um, and I noticed the thing, probably because I was attending them so uh, close together, that their dominant rhetorical framing, so how they spoke about the problems that they were facing, uh, was optimization. So uh, in DC, they were talking a lot about how federal data could be used to optimize education. Um, at Data and Society, they were worried about how um, data could be used to, say, optimize warfare in strange ways. And at uh, the journalism school, they were interested in how um, we might use data to optimize the reading experience or click-through rates or things like this. So um, as a data scientist, um, I hold this framework quite close to my heart. It's, in fact, my dominant rhetorical framing. Sometimes I think about my training as um, essentially the ability to go out into the world and find all these fuzzy problems and bring them into this kind of nice, crisp optimization framework. But at these workshops, I was watching policy wonks, civil society researchers, and journalists all take their own fuzzy problems and couch them into this kind of optimization framework. I, uh, I realized that all the work that we've done over the last few years, working in all these different communities, that a value of ours has leached out into this, into this community. And now they're starting to think in ways that we think in. So um, it made me realize that we've found ourselves as data scientists and people that work with data in a rather privileged and powerful position. And so I think it's probably about time we start thinking hard about how we communicate that work. So, um, I grew up in academia, um, which at the time I thought of as a very kind of open algorithm culture. So I could uh, publish, which typically led to some sort of success, if I opened up the algorithms that I was building and properly explained how they worked to solve some kind of problem. Uh, I became a data scientist in an open source uh, culture, so I would win fame and fortune, maybe, I haven't done it yet, but uh, I would hopefully win fame and fortune if the code that I wrote and the tools that I built um, were used by a lot of people to, to solve some sort of problem. Um, but now, uh, especially as algorithms and as data kind of bursts into the public consciousness, um, I'm starting to think it's becoming important that I open source my values. And I'm using the word value as a kind of shorthand for the things that I think are important, the aspects of the work that I hold dear. Um, as well as open sourcing the algorithms and the code as we've done in the past. So um, if I'm going to communicate properly, I want to try and express how my um, work manifests something of my values in the world. So encouraged by my lab mates, this is the R&D lab at the, at the Times, uh, I'm trying to think in terms of values, uh, which of course is just another rhetorical framework. I'm going to consider the work I do in terms of the design decisions that I make and their consequences. So rather than focusing on optimizing some key performance indicator that's been handed to me. So uh, in this talk, I'm going to show two pieces of work. Um, one's a visualization of the New York Times audience, and one's a segmentation of that same audience. Uh, and I'm, as I do it, I'm going to try open sourcing the values that I hold dear about these pieces. Um, before I get going, I should say these two uh, the three visualizations that I'm going to show uh, are made by Nick Hanselman, who's a creative technologist in the lab, uh, and I recommend his work and his website especially to your, to your attention. Okay, so here's the first visualization. Um, this visualization shows uh, every single page view on the New York Times uh, geolocated. 
So in the lab, this runs as a live visualization in the browser, and it produces this amazing low orbit view of the New York Times audience. So here, every white pixel is an individual person reading the New York Times. So if you've visited the New York Times over the last few months, you've caused the white pixel to lift off the surface of the globe on the screen in the lab um, as, you read the, uh, as you read the site. So the main purpose of this visualization is to set up the next view, which uh, shows the same behavior but rendered on a sitemap of the New York Times. So uh, here you can see this disk. Every, um, every section of the disk is a different section of the New York Times. So you probably can't read it, but there's you know, world and opinion and sports and stuff all around the, uh, the circle of the disk. Um, so uh, along with the PlayStation controller, um, a viewer is able to kind of zoom in to this sitemap and see all the page views as they're happening. We're showing the last three minutes of behavior on the site. Um, in this view, you can see, or hopefully you can see two colors of pixels. There are red pixels, which are people moving between pages uh, inside the times. And there are green pixels, which show people coming from external referrers uh, onto the site. You can also see these blue lines, which are well-trafficked paths through the New York Times, mostly from the home page, which you can kind of see in the middle of the disk out into the rest of the site. So when we show people this at the New York Times, it causes them to start asking questions like crazy. So they ask questions about behavior, and they ask questions about the site structure. We think about this visual visualization as a kind of question-generating machine. And these questions are now asked in the context of being able to see the whole of the behavior on the site. Um, so people ask questions in the context of knowing the kind of relative uh, power of external referrers compared to, say, the home page. They can see how the audience is um, mostly concentrated on a few articles in the New York Times, but also that we have this long tail of behavior across the whole site. So um, I'll tell you about the algorithm very quickly. We think about um, these two visualizations, the globe and the sitemap, as two embeddings. Essentially, they're spatiotemporal scatter plots. So for the, um, the globe, we use the IP address of the inbound page view that we get and geolocate it. Uh, and render it using the, the latitude and longitude on the surface of a sphere. And then for this, for this visualization, we take the URL uh, of, the, um, of the page that someone's reading and use the URL content and the structure to deterministically map that onto a point in the, uh, on the disk. So uh, that's how we think about the algorithm. The source, uh, again, I apologize, Jared, there's no R, but um, we receive a feed of JSON from the New York Times that comes in at about one to three kilohertz, depending on how much news, I should say messages per second, depending on the news. Um, and we use an in-house open source toolkit that we've built called Stream Tools to uh, take that varying uh, rate stream and turn it into a nice plodding one message per second piece of JSON that we can send to the browser that's running this visualization through a WebSocket. And then in the browser is running JavaScript and OpenGL to, uh, to actually implement the embeddings. So um, that hopefully roughly describes how this visualization works. But it doesn't really explain the visualization much at all. So um, depending on what you're interested in, what your background is, you might not be that interested in the technicalities or maybe the politics of the embedding. You might not be that bothered about um, stream, uh, stream processing or trying to render so many pixels in the browser. And so when we show people this visualization in the lab, we, um, we typically try and think about the values that it captures. So the first one is a lack of aggregation. So uh, in these visualizations, we try and show every single um, data point that we have access to. We try and show everybody in the audience over the last three minutes uh, as a pixel. So um, there's no histograms in this. There are no rate calculations. There are no time series. There are no network diagrams. Everybody is visible. The second is that we think um, that it's OK that we make visualizations that generate questions without necessarily answering them. We think visualizations that answer questions are an entirely different kettle of fish and deserve a very, very different treatment. And so as part of that, that allows uh, Nick to focus on making these visualizations very visually spectacular and producing um, interactions that draw people into the visualization to get them asking interrogative questions. And then the third piece is that 
This is a live visualization. And we think live data is incredibly important because it brings the viewer close to the sensor. And by sensor here, I mean JavaScript running in all of the browsers of all of the people that are reading the New York Times. And by being close to the sensor, we get close to the system that we're trying to study. We get close to the world that we're trying to build for or reason about. OK, so um, these are the three values for, uh, for this piece. So this visualization is to set up the, um, the second piece, which is the audience segmentation. So again, we're showing page views coming off the surface of the globe, but this is a bit more abstract. These page views are color coded. So you can see blue pixels are pixels on the home, uh, pardon me, are, uh, views on the home page. Red pixels are views on section fronts, like um, sports and world and news and so on. Uh, and then gray pixels are everything else. So page views on articles, blog posts, interactives, and the like. Um, we use a world, uh, we use this globe to uh, try and make this data immediately interpretable so that you feel that these pixels have something to do with human activity. And it's this human uh, behavior that we were asked to study for this piece. Um, we wanted to split the people captured by this visualization up into segments so that we could maybe build different products for different segments or market at different segments differently or advertise at different segments. So we were wondering what kind of behavioral segments reveal themselves just from the behavioral data that we can collect from the site. So we're trying to turn the segmentation problem into one of behavioral clustering. And so for any kind of clustering, we need two things. We need an object to cluster. So in this case, an object that represents behavior in some way. And we need a distance metric between those, those two objects. So I'm just going to very briefly describe the algorithm for that. So what we do is we take this data and we turn it into reading sessions. So a reading session is when you come to the New York Times, read a bunch of articles, and then leave. That's kind of one session. Um, so these four events on the timeline capture five transitions. We come from somewhere off the site to the home page, from the home page to a section front, through a couple of pages, and then we leave the site. So we've got five transitions that we can capture with a super simple little Markov model. And so um, we're going to, sorry, let's slow down. So we're going to represent this behavior using uh, a transition matrix that captures these, these, tran these transitions. Um, and this, this describes the ijth element of that transition matrix. So this matrix gives us an object that represents the behavior in that session. And we have one matrix per session. So we've got a bunch of matrices. Um, for the distance metric, um, we we use the, uh, the divergence between every row of the transition matrix, uh, of two transition matrices. So each row of a transition matrix is a distribution, and so we can use the divergence to get some measure of, of, uh, of distance between the two things, and then we sum up the divergences of, of the rows. So uh, we actually played with a bunch of different metrics, and they all pretty much, they all pretty much did a good job. Um, we can use this object that represents behavior and this distance metric now in a clustering algorithm. So we used a very, very simple online k-means um, clustering algorithm to capture a set of different behaviors on the, uh, on the site. So what you can see are a bunch of different behavioral segments. Every column represents a behavior. Every row in every column represents a reading session. And every pixel in every session represents an individual page view that went into building these models. So every segment corresponds to a different stereotypical transition matrix. Um, so, uh, and we found a bunch of behaviors that the New York Times already knows about. So these are the one and dones, this, this kind of single solid gray line. This is people just coming to the page, reading one article, and then leaving. And this is the dominant way that people use the New York Times. Uh, we also have the home page watchers. These are people that sit uh, with the home page open on their screen all day, incurring um, the uh, regular home page refreshes, and so page views, and occasionally dip into the site and out, but mostly they're focusing on the home page. Um, we also found basically all of the other segments um, were ones that the New York Times doesn't regularly talk about. So I get to name them, which is always a, a terrible mistake. So uh, these are the home page bouncers. So these are people that come read an article, from there go to the home page, and then from the home page out into the rest of the site. And we found that there was quite a distinct cluster of behaviors corresponding to that kind of uh, use case. And then these guys over here, um, you can't quite see the red, the red line, but these are section front starters. And so all of these start on the section front uh, and then use that as their launching off point 
into the rest of the New York Times. Um, so the code, uh, no, not that. The code uh, that I'm going to not talk about, because it's all in Python, um, is, yeah, good, thanks. That's my first boo. That's great, thank you. So uh, the code's all in Python. Um, but essentially, what we're doing is building an online k-means algorithm. We need to build uh, a piece of code that sessionizes streams of data. So the inbound stream gets turned into a reading session. And we can also write some code. Because we're coming up with a bunch of little dynamic models, we can write some code to um, uh, automatically segment people as they're transitioning through the site. So because we have these, we've used kind of live data and these online learning algorithms to end up with some dynamic models, we can perform the segmentation and predict people's behavior using them as they're traversing the site. So um, I've described a little bit very quickly how the algorithm works and not really spoken much about the code. Um, but I've made a couple of uh, assumptions for you guys uh, in describing the algorithm. So I've kind of basically assumed you're happy with Markov chains. Uh, with online k-means. I've also kind of hoped that you'd let me be relatively fast and loose with the callback Leibler divergence. None of these things might be true, which is fine, because what's important about this piece of work is really the um, values that we're trying to um, get across, the values that we're trying to manifest at the New York Times. So, um, oh, I have to step through these again, sorry. So uh, the values, hopefully it's clear that the values from the first um, visualization still hold. So um, we're performing, when we show the visualization, we're not doing any aggregation. So every single data, set, data point that went into the building of the model is represented. And for this visualization, it's trying to uh, introduce trust into the people inside the New York Times who might want to uh, actually go ahead and put this out on the site. We're trying to not hide anything as a way of generating trust in what is otherwise a slightly uh, scary model for, for people in the business to, to try and grok. Um, again, we're using live data. So this means that we can use the models that we're building. We can build them in an adaptive way so that they adjust to changing behaviors on the site. And we can use them to perform the segmentation, like I said, as people are actually going through the site rather than at some later date on some fixed data set. Um, and then the third, and this is probably the most important for this piece, is that we're focusing on behavior. So we're building a segmentation algorithm in a rather busy marketplace. There are lots of segmentation algorithms, and there are lots of companies that do this kind of audience segmentation. But typically, they focus on demography, or they focus on tastes. Uh, and I quite actively dislike both these sorts of segmentations, not because they have any real effect on any KPI that I'm interested in, not because they affect the bottom line. I just don't like how they treat people. I wouldn't like to be treated uh, either as a, an English, white, middle-aged guy living in Brooklyn. I don't like that the New York Times might think of me like that. And I certainly don't like that the New York Times might treat me, might show me news depending on what news I've read in the past. That's not what I want to get out of the New York Times. Um, so uh, when we build these algorithms, we try and embed uh, this value that what I would really like the New York Times to adapt to is my behavior. And so all of the aspects of the algorithm are trying to embed that value to try and manifest that value somehow in the New York Times. Um, so it's not taste and it's not demography that we should be building around, it's behavior. And I do like the idea that the New York Times might try and adapt to how I want to use it. So um, hopefully uh, I'm trying to I've got across this point. I think it's necessary for properly communicating the data science that we do now, especially in this privileged position that we've found ourselves in, um, but not sufficient to open source the algorithm. I think it's necessary but not sufficient to open the code that we use to do it uh, when, it's, when that's possible. Um, but I think it's becoming more and more important that we are explicit about the fact that there are values in the code that we write and that we open, them, open those up, at least to ourselves, um, so that we can operate properly in this, in this new position of privilege that we find ourselves in. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs>